What's up gang? Today's video is part three in the three part series where I'm going over DIY out of state hunts, freelance hunting, and today I'm recapping my Iowa hunt, sharing with you how I use those two approaches to fill my Iowa buck tag. My name is Clint Campbell and if you're not familiar with the channel, I cover all bow hunting tips, strategies, and techniques to help all of us become better bow hunters. And today's video is a recap video of my Iowa hunt. I've done two other parts of this video series that include the how to plan an out-of-state DIY public land whitetail hunt and then also how to incorporate freelance or freestyle hunting into your out-of-state approach. This recap video is showing you how I took those two things, put them together uh, in order to fill my Iowa buck tag. And so I wanted to go through today and just show you how this hunt kind of unfolded and what decisions I had to make and how freestyle hunting kind of played a role and filling this tag ultimately. So to get started, we're just gonna dive into the map. So I drew an Iowa tag, I was in zone six, um, and I had two weeks to try to get the job done. Now, truth be told, I did go out and scout in March uh, for like three days, um, but most of my scouting that took place was not necessarily where I ended up hunting. So we'll go ahead and jump into the map. So I scouted about 500 acres of this, didn't find any sheds, and found just a little bit of sign Ended up marking here that I had a bed where I ended up jumping uh, a deer out of, which looked to be a buck just from the body size. The fields that you see here uh, that, I'm, that my cursor is going over, these aren't agriculture fields. These are more of like the CRP type of fields. And I scouted those, didn't find any sheds, found very limited sign in this general area. And when I got over to this area here, I ended up running into some uh, some sign that looked like that looked like people had been hunting there. There was a stand that was actually still hung in the tree. So when I started my hunt, I was in I was into the hunt for a couple days, and I ended up running into a local who, whenever we were trading, you know, information, asked me where I had been scouting, and I told him where, and I told him I was planning to maybe take a look over along this lake that I had some interest around here, and I hadn't scouted that yet. Now he had said that he had hunted that years ago, and that he had always seen decent deer in this general area. So that was enough for me to kind of say, hey, you know what, I should probably go over and just kind of freestyle my way through this thing or freelance hunt this thing and see if anything interesting pops up. So the first day that I walked in, it was actually an afternoon. I hunted somewhere else in the morning because I didn't want to go in at dark. So I waited until I got some daylight and walked in and it was maybe 10, 1030 when I walked in. This was my access point here. And on a lot of the trip, I was getting a lot of south and southwest wind uh, early and then it turned north. Uh, later in the trip. And then as I got toward the end of the trip, uh, it turned back uh, south as well. So the middle part of the trip, it got really cold. So this beginning part of the trip, it was actually just a little bit you know, warm for the beginning of November. And so whenever I went to make my way in, there was like an access path here. There's a pine thicket that's right here. And what I, the other information I'd also got from the, from the local was that a new person had just bought this property about a year ago that was to the east and they were big time deer hunters and had put in some some food plots and were doing a lot of habitat work so that kind of told me that you know this general area might have some decent deer on it that are trying to use this private piece of property as a place to to feed and then dipping back onto the public to for for bedding so this was just a hypothesis, of course. So I didn't know any of this. It was just, it was a guess that I was making. So I parked here. I ended up using this access trail to hike my way in. As I worked my way in, I started seeing a bunch of scrapes right away. Um, and so that kind of piqued my interest. I mean, this whole kind of old logging road was just littered with scrapes. I think I found 12 scrapes along the way, but they were interesting because there were so many of them. There weren't any of them that were just so tight together that told me that I needed to stop. And they all looked like they were relatively fresh. So it seemed like they were getting tended but they were sort of out in the open a little bit. And so even though I felt like that sign was pretty good, I kind of pressed on. And ultimately I wanted to make my way down to this, to this lake. As I'd mentioned, it was a little bit warm for that time of year. And so I thought that if I could get close to the water, I'd probably get co you know, close to some really good diversity of habitat and that it would likely be cooler down here as well. And that you know, if I'm a big buck during, you know, this would probably be like November 6th that I would probably likely look for a place to lay low along some really thick cover uh, during the warmer part of the day and then start making my move, you know, in the mid afternoon, you know, to, on toward evening. And so I worked my way down this trail and I turned onto this log, this old logging road here and all this over to like the north of this, uh, of this uh, icon 
was all select cut and there's a little bit of a draw here you can see. And so once I got in here and I made this turn onto this you know little path to try to get down to this lake, there was just hammer sign laid down here. I mean, there was a, a rub that was like neck high on a tree. And then there was also, you know, along a couple, uh, along a couple trees that were dotting that, that path, there were, you know, like five, six scrapes that were all within like a 15 yard area and it was all fresh. And so when I had seen that, I was immediately thinking, I was like, all right, I got to set up here, you know, which a lot of times I wouldn't necessarily, you know, use that setup because it, it was along a, a path that I felt like they were probably traveling, but it was a little more open than I wanted. But all that thick cover that was, that was in this draw here from that select cut, you know, it was, it was against side cover. So I felt pretty good about that. And then this here was just like a big, you know, hardwood ridge with, you know, with oaks on it and so forth. So I ended up setting up, setting up on, in a tree here with about a 20 yard shot to, uh, to that primary scrape area. Now where I failed was I should have walked down this path just a little further to see what was down here, maybe another 20 yards. Cause there was another scrape down here, um, that I, that I didn't recognize at first. So I got in the tree this is probably around uh, 11 o'clock or so, 11, 11.30 maybe. And I ended up having a shooter walk up uh, at uh, about 1.30 in the afternoon, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Mid-140s, 8-point, 28-yard shot, and I missed him clean. If you listen to the podcast, you've heard me tell this story. Uh, pretty bummed out about that, but what happened here was is I read the sign correctly and things were kind of playing out, which gave me the confidence that, hey, you know, these scrapes that seem to be hot and this sign that seems to be hot is, is, seems like it's going to work in my favor. So I just need to, you know, keep finding the hot sign and keep, you know, uh, plugging away and freelancing through this piece. So I was pretty discouraged after missing that deer and ended up backing out and I ended up hunting somewhere else for like two, two or three days. I kind of freelanced around a couple other spots. But there was something about this spot that told me that I needed to continue to come back. It was just, you know, as I was thinking about it, I had seen some does in here before I seen that buck. So I knew there were does in the area. And I really liked this pine thicket that was over here that was really dense and gnarly with a ton of cover. And then you can't really see it from this map, but this little area here is basically a, a cut cornfield that this farmer was letting his cattle graze in. And so my thinking was that you can see all like the really thick cover that's in this general area here, a bunch down around this lake, right? This big kind of draw with thick, nasty cover here. And so I was thinking, I was like, well, if I'm a, if I'm a doe and I live in here, like I'm probably headed over to this food source in the evening to eat. So if, if there's a good buck in this area that gets on a doe, the chances are they're going to make their way to this food source. Now, the trick was I had to figure out, you know, I had to find that doe one and that all, that all had, had to kind of play out. So I finally went back to the piece and decided instead of headed back down here, I decided I wanted to kind of make a move through and, and check out more of this piece to see if I found a, you know, an even better setup. So I ended up kind of you know, headed to the, 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 the southern part of this, of this piece. I want to say I think I had a straight south wind on, on that particular piece uh, that day. And so I walked in, there was a small trail that was over this way that I could kind of make my way through. And I was just kind of surveying the land as far as like, you know, there were a ton of scrapes along these old logging roads. And so I was really kind of prioritizing that as a way to kind of make my way through quickly. That way I'm not wasting a ton of time. And then if I had seen something that piqued my interest, then I can kind of dive in a little further and further scout that general area. And so I made my way along here. And what I got to was, there was a hammer rub that was right here with a couple scrapes that weren't necessarily anything you know crazy, nothing to write home about. The rub piqued my interest because it was huge, uh, but it looked more like a signpost rub than it did like a specific deer, you know, making making all that sign. So I kept kind of making my way to the south, and when I got over here, there was just like you can see there's like this little depression here. And I liked that because if I were a deer and I was bedded back in here anywhere, and I assumed that that buck was likely bedding, bed, bedding in this general area. And if I were a deer and I was going to go feed, or if I was a buck and I was going to go find does in the evening along a food source, I'd probably take this little, this draw here and these little depressions out so I could scent check my way out as I make my way over to this food. And so I ended up finding a good tree to get in. There was a scrape. And then also back in the timber, there were two cedar trees that were kind of ripped up. And when I say ripped up, they were gouged with, with tine marks. And so I ended up setting up here. And that first day that I set up there, I had the same 
145 mid 140s inch eight point pop out. And so when I set up in this tree, a doe came busting out of the back here, you know, kind of like somewhat out of this draw and worked her way up through here. And he was kind of nudging her along. He wasn't pushing her hard. She came up here and just started kind of grazing. And he walked out and gave me another 28 yard shot. And I missed him again. And if you listen to the podcast, you heard me tell that story. So this time he popped out with a doe. So my thinking here was that if he has a doe with him, he's likely not going to break away, you know, and completely change. Like the one thing you know is that doe families and does, you know, a lot of times want to stay, you know, in their general home, home area. And so I was playing the odds and thinking that this doe is likely bedding and living back here somewhere. And I still felt like he was probably bedding back there just based on all the sign that I had seen that he had laid down. And so I felt pretty confident that they weren't going to necessarily move on, that this was the area that he was going to try to keep her and, and, and breed her. And so in, in knowing that or in thinking that, I was like, you know, and if, if this doe, like she's still kind of moving on her idea of, you know, bed to food, right? That buck is, is nudging her around, but she's still trying to eat every day and trying to get back to bed. And so I felt like if I still kind of continued to play this general area, that I would have another encounter with this, I'd have another encounter with this deer. Um, so the next day I came back, instead of sitting that same tree, I ended up moving just a little bit closer to where I had missed, had missed him. So you have the main draw that's coming up off this lake, and then these little kind of, you know, what I'll refer to as like mini draws or just small depressions in the topography that they were using to kind of come out. I moved in just a little bit closer thinking that if they do the same thing that they did before, which was follow that out, which would make sense because they're going to use the thermals and then in the evenings as the sun's going down, you know, the thermals are starting to pull into those low spots. And so I'd assume that they would maybe make the same play. So I moved in just a little bit closer to cut the distance because I was like, if that deer comes out in a similar area, I'll be closer to take a better shot or have a better shot opportunity. I moved a little closer the next night or the next evening and uh, he came out again, but this time you know, there's a little, there's a little bench that was right in here. So you have this depression that they were all, that they were, you know, feeding out of. And there's like a little, just like a small little rise that happens, you know, right, right in this general area. And when he came out, he stepped up onto that rise and was just kind of waiting and checking the wind and seeing what was going on. And I never got a shot opportunity. I mean, he was at 26 yards looking right at me and I couldn't get drawn and I had to just watch him walk. And he basically just walked right back into the cover. What I realized was, was that he was waiting for the wind to swirl there as he was standing on that little high spot. He knew that if he stood there long enough, he would get a little kick up of the wind and he'd be able to scent check that whole area. And I don't think he completely winded me, but I think he got enough that he just didn't know and wasn't 100% certain what happened. So the next night I changed trees and he ended up coming out above me here, just to the north of me, switched, got behind me in this pine thicket. I was working a southwest wind in this area and he ended up, I ended up hearing a, a, a twig snap and... He was standing over here. He, uh, at that point, he had winded me and he had seen me. Uh, he had seen me move and he was out of there. So I thought at that point the hunt might have been done, but like he, I felt like that deer was confident in that area and that he wouldn't completely abandon it. He had a doe. I saw him with the doe twice um, unless he had bred her at that point. But I was still kind of banking on the fact that there was way too much sign in there for me just to kind of like, you know, let it go. But I wasn't willing to kind of hunt in the same general area again i knew i needed to kind of tear that piece apart at this point i had like two days left in the hunt and i needed to figure out where this deer was at or another deer what i ended up doing was coming back in um the the next day and hiked in along this trail again but where i got to this rub right here with with a couple scrapes i ended up diving into the timber and following a rub line that went through the timber and as you can see i mapped my trail and walked across this ridge up this you know down to this side of this draw up this ridge got to another spot here where i found another scrape i found a couple beds along the way i don't know if they were his or not they were big solo beds so it was you know i'm assuming that it was a buck of some sort and i kept following the scrapes that were in the timber and the rubs that were in the timber and this is the the, the path that i found now this is where i had hunted and seen him previously but all the sign had led me to just the back end of that area where i saw him dip into and when i got to this general area here I ended up bumping a buck. For most people, they may think that the hunt's over at that point because they bumped the buck out of there. But for me, I was like, that just confirmed for me that that was either the buck that I missed or that was a new buck and he was back in there. So either way, that meant that that place was good to go. 
I ended up finding a triple trunk tree that I set up in here. I was using kind of the edge of this draw as a barrier, knowing that if they wanted to get downwind to scent check me on any type of north wind, because I had north that day, um, that they were going to have to, I'm sorry, I had south that day that was switching to a north. And I knew if they were going to, if I was going to work any type of north wind here, that I could use this draw as a barrier and that they would have to expose themselves in this draw because it opens up just a little bit. If they didn't want to expose themselves, they'd have to hug this, you know, this draw a little bit tighter and give me a shot opportunity, or they would come in from, from, from this way. So I set up right then and there, ended up having, uh, a, a young, you know, rack eight work his way in from, from the east. Basically came down this little draw here, right to me. I let him go, of course. And then there at very last light, I had another buck, a young buck, do the same thing, work his way in through this little low spot, came in on the top, worked his way back in, walked right by me. So <clears throat> that felt good because I, I felt like that was a heavily traveled spot. That there obviously were does back in there because I had bucks cruising it. So the next day, you know, and I typically weren't, wasn't hunting the same trees over and over again, but because this was an area that I jumped the buck out of, I was like, you know what, this is the setup that I'm going to hunt. So I didn't even hunt it in the morning. I was waiting until the evening because every shot opportunity I had on this piece was between like one in like one o'clock and three thirty. So there wasn't really any morning activity on any of the hunts that I had done on this this piece in the mornings. So I ended up packing up camp, getting ready to leave Iowa, and walked in to hunt this piece in the afternoon and got up in a tree and sure enough I had at this point and when I got in there, I actually had a north wind, like a northwest wind, so it was coming this way right? And slowly throughout the day, it was going to change to Southwest, which is almost a killer. But I felt pretty good about it because I was going to have a wind that was either going to blow up in my face and blow the hunt, or I was going to be hunting just enough of an off wind where that deer, if he came in like I thought he would, like the other deer had, come in from this little low spot and work their way toward this tree location, that if I cut the wind just right, they would come in with confidence and have no clue that I was there. And so I set up here, I did a small rattling sequence with some light, uh, some light tending grunts, I actually hit a, a, an estrus bleat, and at around 3.30, I heard some brush crack, and sure enough, from this little low spot, walking in down this trail like I had thought, this little deer trail that was through here, it was really kind of lightly used and hard to see, he walked right through here, stopped at 16 yards, and gave me a shot opportunity. And I arrowed him, and then this mark here is where I ended up finding him. So at the end of the day, I ended up using, you know, completely using a, uh, a freelance style of hunting. I walked into this piece with no information. I kept kind of putting pieces of information together as I would get another piece of information. I'd put the puzzle together until I figured out where I thought this deer was spending time. And then the last move was really the move that allowed me to put an arrow in. I mean, the reality is I should have, I should have killed the first deer on three different occasions. It just never was just never able to, able to get the job done. And I just kind of kept tightening the noose, tightening the noose, tightening the noose, and getting into a spot to where I would catch them while they were their most comfortable and, and, and least on alert. Um, and that's what, the, that's what paid off in this particular stand location. So that's basically how I put a freelance hunt together in, in Iowa and was able to fill my buck tag. I think anybody can do this. It's a really cool style of hunting. It's a style of hunting that lends itself to out-of-state hunts because we so many times on these out-of-state trips walk into places that we don't have a lot of information about or we don't have a lot of information about a place and that keeps us from walking in. And if I would have followed that same line of thinking and not walked into this piece, there's a good chance I would have came home with an unfilled tag. Fortunately, I decided just to kind of roll the dice, walk into an area that I had no information about and just learn it on the fly and continue to put the pieces together until I ended up with the opportunities that I wanted to have and ultimately wrapping my tag around an Iowa buck. Thanks for watching this video. I hope it gives you the confidence to do some DIY out of state public land hunts and do some freestyle hunting. If you've not subscribed yet to the channel, hit the subscribe button and click the bell notification to make sure you get all the upcoming podcasts and videos.